Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first virtual Key Opinion Leader event hosted by CERNOVA. I'm Dr. Philip Talakis, President and CEO of CERNOVA Carp. Today's event will focus on thyroid disease and the potential of a cell therapy treatment as a novel approach. Our Key Opinion Leader for this event is Sam Wiseman. I'd like to make a little introduction uh, to Sam to begin with. Dr. Sam Wiseman is an academic for thyroid and parathyroid surgeon and an internationally recognized expert in the management of thyroid and parathyroid disease. He is professor of surgery in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia and is an attending surgeon at St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver. Dr. Wiseman attended medical school and completed residency training in general surgery at the University of Manitoba, obtaining a fellowship in surgery from the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada in 2000. At Roswell Park Cancer Institute, he completed fellowships in head and neck surgery, surgical oncology, and oncology research. Dr. Wiseman joined the staff of St. Paul's Hospital and the UBC in 2003. He is also a fellow of the American College of Surgeons and a consultant surgical oncologist at the British Columbia Cancer Agency. Dr. Wiseman currently serves as the research head for the Department of Surgery at Providence Healthcare and is the chair of the Endocrine Tumor Group at the BCCA. He has authored more than 150 peer-reviewed scientific publications, numerous book chapters, and served as senior editor of the medical textbook, Gray's Surgical Anatomy. Dr. Wiseman's research has been presented globally, and he has received numerous awards and honors throughout his career. That includes Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research Scholar Award and Canada's Top 40 Under 40 Award. Dr. Wiseman, thank you very much for joining us today. A recorded version that will be made available on CERNOVA's website and CERNOVA's YouTube channel following today's discussion. In terms of organization, we will first have the presentation, and this will be followed with questions and answers uh, to go through your questions that you may have that we've received through email. For those just joining us, welcome, and I now pass it on to Dr. Weisman. Hello, everyone. It's a real pleasure speaking to you all today. I would like to thank CERNOVA for the opportunity to do this. This is really an exciting topic for me. I will be discussing a new approach for management of postoperative hypothyroidism. First, let's review a bit about the thyroid. The thyroid is an important endocrine gland located in the neck in the midline, a bit above the top of the breastbone, and it straddles the windpipe. The thyroid produces thyroid hormones, also called triiodothyronine, or T3, and thyroxine, or T4. These hormones are essential for life and regulate virtually all bodily systems, including metabolism, growth, sleep, and mood. Interestingly, the level of the thyroid hormone in the bloodstream is tightly regulated by the hypothalamus, a part of the brain, and the pituitary gland that is located at the base of the brain. This circuit is called the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. As you can see here, overactivity of the thyroid gland that leads to too much production of thyroid hormones is referred to as hyperthyroidism and speeds up the metabolism and may have many negative effects that include hair loss, sweating, tremor, and insomnia. The opposite is true for underactivity of the thyroid gland, which leads to production of too little thyroid hormone, referred to as hypothyroidism, that slows down the metabolism and may also have many side effects in the body, including constipation, weight gain, and fatigue. Thyroid gland dysfunction is very common. Many of you may yourselves or have family members or friends who have at some point been diagnosed with either an overactive or underactive thyroid gland requiring treatment. Not surprisingly, the popular media has picked up on this and management of thyroid problems often becomes a cover story. So how common is thyroid dysfunction? Thyroid dysfunction is very common. Greater than 200 million people 
worldwide will be diagnosed annually. This is affects women disproportionately more than men. And interestingly, hypothyroidism is more common than hyperthyroidism in terms of thyroid dysfunction. Close to 5% of Americans greater than 12 years of age will be diagnosed with hypothyroidism annually. And the annual economic cost of thyroid dysfunction for society is in the billions of dollars. As you can see here from market analysis, not surprisingly, the majority of this market is focused on hypothyroidism treatment with oral medications. While there are many different possible reasons people become hypothyroid, as a surgeon, I am focused on my patients who undergo removal of their thyroid gland and thyroid operations are amongst the most common neck surgeries performed in most countries. It is estimated that annually in the United States alone there are more than 150,000 thyroidectomies performed. All people who undergo removal of their entire thyroid gland or total thyroidectomy and many people who undergo removal of a portion of their thyroid gland or hemithyroidectomy require lifelong thyroid hormone replacement. It is currently recommended by guidelines that thyroid hormone replacement be a daily oral synthetic thyroid hormone, levothyroxine, with a dose that is adjusted based on laboratory measurements of blood TSH, short for thyroid simulating hormone level. Research has shown that despite a normal blood TSH level, up to 10% of people receiving oral thyroid hormone replacement experience symptoms of thyroid dysfunction. These can include lethargy, fatigue, memory impairment, depression, cold intolerance, hoarseness, dry skin, body weight, gain, and constipation. There are many possible reasons for the persistence of symptoms of thyroid dysfunction in the setting of normal thyroid blood tests in patients who are receiving thyroid hormone replacement. And these include patient factors that include age, sex, weight, the presence of other medical conditions like pregnancy or gastrointestinal or renal diseases, other factors including things like concurrent oral intake of foods and other medications, as well as patient compliance and laboratory monitoring protocols may also contribute. Even if these factors are all optimized, there may be more fundamental differences that vary between people. And these have been theorized to include differences in the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis set point for circulating thyroid hormone concentrations as well as loss of the T3 derived from the thyroid itself, leading to lower circulating T3 and T4 ratios in individuals who are on replacement therapy. Based on a desire I have to overcome the limitations of current treatment of hypothyroidism in postoperative patients that we have just reviewed, including avoidance of lifelong daily oral thyroid hormone dependence and regular laboratory testing, I became interested if it was possible to preserve thyroid function and the integrity of the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis by transplanting some of the removed thyroid gland into a vascularized Cernova cell pouch that had been implanted into a separate area of the body outside of the neck. Here you can see our proposed approach in these images. First, a cell pouch is implanted into the abdominal wall of a patient who is scheduled for a thyroid operation when it becomes, where it becomes vascularized over the following month. Then, when the thyroid gland is removed, at the time of operation, a portion of it is transplanted 
into the cell pouch, over time this transplant engrafts and releases thyroid hormone into the bloodstream, restoring the patient's hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis and eliminating the need for lifelong oral thyroid hormone supplementation. So, why transplant thyroid into a pre-implanted cell pouch and not just into the patient's native tissues? The cell pouches have a rich blood supply that helps encourage the transplant engraftment. As well, they have several other characteristics that make them suited for transplantation of endocrine cells and tissues. When we started our collaboration, preclinical research had already shown this approach could work for transplantation of another endocrine cell type, islet cells that produce insulin for the treatment of diabetes. And so, a few years ago, with grant support from the BC Transplant Research Foundation Venture Grant Program, I collaborated with Cernova and developed a preclinical study. This study was aimed to evaluate the cell pouch for transplantation of human thyroid tissue as a possible new treatment for postoperative hypothyroidism. Our preclinical study evaluating transplantation of human thyroid tissue into the cell pouch has shown promising results and a manuscript has currently been submitted for publication. Here you can see histology sections of viable human thyroid tissue that has been removed and during surgery transplanted into the cell pouch in a mouse preclinical model. It was removed three months later and evaluated. Not only is the thyroid tissue viable, but the machinery for thyroid hormone production also seems to be preserved. As you can see here, at four times and at 20 times magnification, staining of transplanted tissues in the cell pouch for thyroglobulin in green, a protein that follicular cells produce and becomes thyroid hormone, and thyroperoxidase in red, an enzyme that is produced by thyroid cells that is involved in conversion of thyroglobulin into thyroid hormones. We were also able to measure human thyroglobulin in the blood of transplanted mice. I believe what you are seeing here is very exciting and represents a critical step towards an entirely new treatment for post-thyroidectomy hypothyroidism. And so for Cernova's first therapeutic product in the thyroid space with an aim of restoring thyroid function in patients with post-thyroidectomy hypothyroidism, here are the key steps that have been identified to move this novel treatment forward from the bench into the clinic. And last, but definitely not least, Cernova's second therapeutic product in the thyroid space that I'm also very excited about is, the, is this transplanting immune protected thyroid cells and tissues, meaning that we can extend thyroid transplantation to not only post-surgical patients, but to all patients who are hypothyroid. And so I'd like to conclude this presentation with a few final comments. As a thyroid surgeon, perhaps the most common question I get from my patients who are facing these operations is if there's any way they can preserve the function of their thyroid and avoid lifelong thyroid medications. This is even a, made more of a concern to them than the risks of surgical complications, which I believe is quite incredible. 
This is why I believe I'm very excited about this program because as a surgeon, we will be able to offer our patients an option for avoiding lifelong hypothyroidism and dependence on thyroid medications. I'd also like to, in conclusion, thank Cernova for being excellent collaborators on this project and I'm excited to work with them and move forward this new and exciting field. And as well, I'd like to thank all of you for attending and listening to this presentation. And I welcome your questions. Thank you. We've got a lot of questions, bunch of questions to go through here. Thanks everyone again for your attention. So question um, number one, I'll read them out and then I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, please explain what kinds of issues would cause the thyroid gland to work in an abnormal way and what types of patients who are having their thyroid gland removed would be good candidates for Synova's cell pouch. Another way of putting it is what are the causes of thyroid dysfunction? In terms of the abnormalities that cause hypothyroidism, I believe we, always re we already reviewed these in my uh, presentation. Currently, patients who are undergoing thyroid surgery for benign disease, including goiters, nodules, diagnostic procedures, and surgery for hypothyroid hyperthyroidism would be candidates for transplantation of their own thyroid tissue into the cell pouch. As discussed in the future, in the setting of immune protection of thyroid transplants, most hypothyroid patients would be eligible for this treatment. Okay, question number two. Can you talk a bit about your direct experience with your patients who have not been served well following thyroid removal with the thyroid medications alone? What have they experienced and how do you think these patients would respond to the possibility of having a cell therapy treatment that could better control their thyroid hormone release? For reasons that I, I already reviewed in the presentation, there's a subset of hypothyroid patients, up to 10%, who continue to experience symptoms of thyroid dysfunction despite normal thyroid blood tests. I think probably most commonly I hear from patients that they just tell me that they just don't feel right and uh, would especially have complaints relating to their uh, low energy levels as well as uh, weight gain. Cell pouch thyroid transplantation could potentially overcome the limitations we discussed by providing patients functional thyroid tissue that is not impacted by that long list of considerations and confounders that uh, I reviewed in the presentation. It's very important that uh, future clinical study definitely needs to uh, include evaluation of patient reported outcomes, including quality of life measures. Question number three, in patients who are having their thyroid gland removed, is it easy to determine the healthy from the not healthy tissue? How is this done? So distinguishing uh, healthy from unhealthy thyroid tissue after thyroid is removed really relies on evaluation of both its gross and microscopic characteristics. Question number four, if you are transplanting thyroid tissue from your experience, do you think it would be necessary to transplant the entire thyroid gland to get function or do you think a smaller amount could provide the function needed? This is really a very important uh, question that we're act quite actively uh, evaluating and studying just how much thyroid tissue is required for transplantation leading to normal thyroid function. And so, uh, well, while there's bound to be some uh, variation, as I mentioned during the presentation, about 80% of people who have half their thyroid removed, it's actually a little more than half because it also includes the middle of the gland, the isthmus, uh, maintain a normal thyroid hormone level. So it seems that most people can get by with half a gland or even less. Uh, one of the major advantages of the cell pouch approach, uh, I believe, is its dosability, which we also mentioned earlier, or the pouches or transplants can be readily added or um, removed based on uh, patient requirements. Question number five. Would you see a possibility to preserve removed thyroid tissue in a tissue bank for a later potential transplant? 
Also a very uh, excellent question. The answer is definitely uh, yes. Uh, certainly down the road, banking or remove thyroid tissue for individuals would be important for several possible clinical scenarios, including people who are undergoing diagnostic uh, surgery where cancer is being ruled out or for uh, people that want to have the cell pouch transplantation as an option for themselves in the future and um, uh, whether after a partial or a total uh, thyroid procedure. This is why in our preclinical work, uh, we study transplantation of not only freshly procured, uh, but also a, fr a frozen referred to as cryopreserved uh, thyroid tissue. And we're really, uh, it's very important that we are continuing to uh, work on optimizing the uh, thyroid transplant uh, cryopreservation protocols. Okay, question number six, lots of questions here. It's, it's very uh, exciting for me to hear that people are interested in this uh, work. For patients, who have their thyroid glands removed, how big of a burden on the medical system is this in terms of patients visiting doctors and other health professionals? If the cell pouch and cells uh, returned function uh, to the patient, how would this affect this burden? I think also, as you saw in my presentation, because thyroid disease is so common that uh, this, uh, the annual cost is billions of dollars uh, just in the US alone and worldwide, I can't even imagine. And, Certainly a lot of these uh, costs are related to uh, visits to health professionals, medication costs, lab costs for, for this common problem. And I personally think that the societal costs are probably actually a bit higher because, um, and some of you uh, in the uh, audience may have experienced this yourself, but the ability of people who have thyroid dysfunction that's symptomatic, not adequately managed to uh, contribute and work and live their lives is really negatively impacted. And there's a large body of literature which shows that patients who have uh, symptomatic thyroid dysfunction uh, have a significant impairment of their quality of life. Where would the pouch be implanted? Question number seven. The uh, site of cell pouch transplantation uh, will, uh, will be planned to be in the abdominal wall. This is the same location uh, that it's being placed in the current Cernova clinical diabetes study. Question number eight. Thinking about the second proposed treatment using the cell pouch, what are the possible scenarios where a patient's own cells could not be used for transplant and what are other potential avenues to solve those problems? Could there be stem cell derived cells transplant for this program? As we discussed in, uh, in patients with uh, hypothyroidism that occurs for reasons other than uh, it being removed at operation, uh, transplant of immune protected thyroid cells or tissue is, a, is the strategy and such cells or tissues could come from donors like the islets used for islet cell transplantation for treatment of diabetes. And certainly stem cell derived transplants are another uh, possibility and exciting uh, opportunity, I think. Question number nine, is there a subset of thyroid disease that represents a significant unmet Need similar to severe hypoglycemia and awareness. Dehydrating here a little bit with all the questions. So this is, this is a very interesting question as well. There, there really isn't an equivalent scenario to hypoglycemic uh, and awareness in uh, thyroid surgical patients. However, I do uh, believe that uh, uh, the subset of patients which would especially benefit would be uh, the uh, younger patient uh, population. I've seen young, pe otherwise healthy people who can really tolerate hypothyroidism to a point where they're sort of teetering on their on the edge and their lives are in uh, in jeopardy. And uh, this is multifactorial, but unfortunately, as you're probably mo aware, that uh, younger people can be poorly compliant when taking uh, medications and and going for recommended laboratory testing. As well, if you think about a 20 year old who undergoes a a thyroidectomy like the, uh, uh, the gentleman I operated on um, about a week ago, and he needs to start on thyroid medication uh, lifelong. That's a pill a day with intermittent lab testing for 60 to 70 years. That's really a, a very long time. Question number 10, what do you see as the biggest hurdles with a cell therapy approach for uh, treating hypothyroidism? 
So this is another excellent question. Um, uh, again, uh, I think the biggest hurdle will be the time it takes for the clinical study data to accumulate and shift the current uh, mindset. Uh, as you can see, uh, this approach for treatment of hypothyroidism, it's completely uh, novel, it's completely different from current uh, practice and uh, will definitely require a change in the perspective with disruption of the current medical uh, dogma. It's actually quite amazing to me that in the future, after thyroid surgery in my patients, lifelong thyroid post-surgical hormone dependence can actually become avoidable. I think this is, a, this is, a, this is just fantastic. And uh, question number 11, how easy do you think patients will adopt this novel treatment for thyroid disease? And I think I alluded to this at the end of my uh, presentation. Um, uh, basically, uh, uh, ultimately, I believe it's going to be the patients who are going to uh, drive this and who will push toward this uh, and demand this uh, new treatment approach uh, because they don't really want to be on daily medication the rest of their lives if they can avoid it. And they don't want to feel uh, the symptomatic hypothyroidism. They don't want to feel impaired uh, in their functioning. And I, I believe that once uh, clinical trial results uh, become uh, uh, available demonstrating safety and effectiveness, I think most thyroidectomy patients were, will eagerly uh, embrace this uh, new treatment. Um, this is the kind of treatment that I'm getting asked about very commonly by, by people who are having thyroid surgery. So those were the uh, emailed questions. In terms of the, the chat, let me uh, see if there's some questions here. Uh, Got to multitask and look at the chat and talk to everyone at the same time. Uh, is there a need for anti-rejection therapies with the cell pouch or will there be minimal need for it? So I think the answer to that is, is that in this initial application we're talking about, this is the patient's own thyroid tissue. And so it, unlike um, people who are transplanted with islet cells, which are uh, from another source, uh, these patients don't require any um, uh, anti-rejection medications. And like we said, in the future with immune protection, the idea would be to... Uh, uh, avoid uh, anti-rejection medications uh, with uh, by immune protecting uh, transplant. Uh, more questions uh, from the uh, uh, audience of the uh, so uh, of the 150,000 thyroidectomy patients in the USA. How many would in the future? Oh, it's just uh, Chad is lighting up there. Uh, How many in the future potentially be uh, changed to the uh, uh, better but initially costlier SVA regenerative thyroidectomy treatment? That's a that's a great question, and I think that um, uh, I, I think that this one of the other uh, one of the other beauties of of this treatment of this approach is is that. It doesn't, other than other than the cell pouches, it doesn't really require any other exotic uh, equipment. Or um, uh, it's just it's basically a new uh, surgical technique. And so I think that it would. This isn't a type of a procedure. This is the type of procedure which I believe could be disseminated quite uh, quickly to uh, any center uh, which is producing, uh, which is performing uh, thyroid surgery. Uh, can a single pouch in one patient be used to treat diabetics and thyroid disease? Well, I can't really address um, uh, di the diabetes side. That's not my focus. But um, in terms of thyroid disease, uh, this is, again, like I discussed in the presentation, uh, a, um, uh, an area that we're in investigating in terms of the, the dosing. And so whether it can be a single pouch or multiple pouches uh, that are uh, required, and the precise amount of tissue, um, as I as I alluded to, uh, that's something that we're investigating. But either is a, a possibility. How long will it take to make it available for everyone? That's a great uh, question. I think once there is clinical trial data, um, uh, which will take some time, the uh, the like I said, I think dissemination should be quite quickly based you know based on uh, safety and efficacy from clinical trials. Yeah, and I think that there's another question here about what would the uh, uh, cost per case be when comparing its uh, benefits to uh, traditional medications where comparing it to other advanced therapies. And I think that's a great question, and I think that uh, underscores the importance of um, 
uh, and economic analysis as part of uh, these studies. Uh, and uh, again, that's something that needs to be uh, uh, built into uh, clinical trials. There's a, there's a huge uh, literature which shows the cost of um, symptomatic hypothyroidism and its effect on quality of life and um, uh, society. So there is some, some literature there on, but in terms of the cost of this treatment, I, I, I don't think we can say that at this point. And uh, how long before clinical trials are started? That's a great question too. Uh, I don't know that I can can answer that, but I'm excited to uh, uh, I'm excited to move forward with that piece as well. So I think that I've I've addressed most of the um, uh, questions here on the uh, chat and that were mailed in. And maybe I'll uh, hand things over to uh, Philip. I think there were some questions he also wanted to address. Thank you, everyone, again for your interest and your attention. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Wiseman. Yeah, there were a number of questions that came in on the corporate side, so I'd like to just uh, bring some answers to those questions. First one is, can you explain a bit more in detail about the next steps for the thyroid program? And does the work conducted with the cell pouch for diabetes at the University of Chicago help with the advancement of this program? And are you able to use the learnings from uh, the initial clinical trials in diabetes to be able to advance this program uh, faster? So as Dr. Wiseman said, uh, moving forward, we're completing preclinical uh, work in this area and preparing regulatory documentation. And then after that, we will be uh, looking at uh, filing to be able to start clinical trials. So we'll be able to let investors know over um, in, in a period of time as this program is moving ahead with respect to exact timelines and we'll be putting those together. In terms of whether we can learn um, from the, or use the learnings from the cell pouch in the diabetes field, this is absolutely true. We've already shown that cell pouch is safe when it's implanted in patients. We've shown that the device becomes highly vascularized and that the islet cells are able to survive in, in the tissue environment. And most importantly, not only is it important for those cells to survive, but it's also important to be able to prove that there's enough blood vessels in the device to be able to get uh, the therapy into the bloodstream. And we've shown this in a number of patients in uh, diabetes with the, um, with the demonstration of um, ongoing C-peptide. And we've also shown uh, clinical benefit, right, in, some, in the first initial patients. So this is a very good um, indicator in terms of what's going to happen with cell pouch with other types of indications such as thyroid. So we're definitely going to be able to use uh, the information that we have. Secondly, um, our regulatory package that we have put together and is building by our clinical team has been extremely important in terms of building the package around manufacturing and uh, safety and efficacy and that sort of thing. And what we're going to be able to do is add the new information, new data to uh, this uh, regulatory package that we already have, as well as uh, the clinical protocol, et cetera, and be able to move, um, and we expect to move into clinical trials from that side of things. Um, next question is, from an investor perspective, what do you see as a benefit to this program? Well, first of all, we're looking at treating a whole new uh, patient population that we believe no other company has even been thinking about at this point in time. And with over 150,000 patients a year, there's a huge unmet need for uh, this product that can help uh, regulate patients' thyroid uh, hormones in a much better way. Uh, the second part of this is that from the investor side of things, having a second clinical program in a different area than diabetes really helps to de-risk the company and provides uh, a second cell therapy approach for Cernova uh, going forward. So um, we see this as um, a very significant benefit, not only uh, to patients that are going to be receiving this type of treatment, but also uh, to the investors who are investing in the company. Uh, number three, am I correct to assume that there should be very few hurdles in this trial as the cell pouch has been proven safe in the current and previous trials and the cells that will be implanted will be the patient's own cells? So I think, um, you know, in the development of new technologies, new disruptive technologies, there's all these important things for us to learn. And as Dr. Wiseman said, one of the things we are going to learn about is the dosing of the cells. And uh, that's something that would be addressed in the clinical trial. But 
Um, what is really important and key here is that we're using the patient's own tissue for uh, going back into, into the body, and that tissue is going to be minimally um, adjusted so that we believe, um, in speaking with regulatory authorities as we're going forward, that that should allow us to move um, a little bit faster in terms of um, having the, our, the patient's own tissues going in. And secondly, there's no need for immune protection medication. So this, um, we believe from the safety perspective, this is going to be a relatively uh, simpler trial going forward. So uh, the next question is, do you see a faster path to approval with this product using the patient's own cells? So I've kind of answered that question already. And again, this uh, will depend on discussions with regulatory authorities. And, uh, but the important thing here is that we're, doing, we're using uh, minimally manipulated healthy tissue from the patient to transplant into the cell pouch. And uh, from that side of things, we would expect uh, the potential that everything goes well to uh, that this could uh, result in a faster approval than if you were um, just putting uh, stem cell derived uh, technology into the device because it is a simpler type approach. Second, next question is, in your opinion, what do you consider a fast track designation for this program? Well, fast track designation would be something that we would work with with our clinical team going forward. And what that really means is that there's a closer interaction between the company and uh, the FDA in terms of reviewing data as it's coming out. And yes, that's definitely something that the company would be uh, considering going for clinical work. Um, next question is, with this additional program advancing, do you see this as a de-risking factor for shareholders and investors? And as I mentioned earlier, the answer to that question is definitely yes. Um, additional therapeutic uh, programs for a company is a way of expanding the company, de-risking the company, and also building significant valuation um, beyond the initial programs. And we see this as a, a multi-billion dollar type of application and one in which a very significant number of patients can be treated on a yearly basis. Um, so uh, definitely very, very excited about this program and to be uh, working with Dr. Weisman um, and, uh, and staff uh, on that side of things. And uh, the next question is, what do you see as a path to product approval? Well, it's a very a relatively standard path to approval which um, for products such as these. And what we would be looking at is conducting first a phase one, two uh, study. That means looking at safety and efficacy. And then uh, following that, and likely it would be a dosing study. And that study is, um, we're in discussions about what that study is going to look like internally. Um, and then once that uh, study moves forward and is successful, then uh, we would look at either expanding that phase two study or conducting a larger phase uh, three therapeutic study for this, um, for this indication. And there is the opportunity here in this situation to be able to conduct a study that could potentially involve uh, a number of sites and uh, potentially a number of countries. So this is something that we're discussing internally right now. Um, so again, there are a number of questions about when we're going to be starting this trial. And I think what we're, what we're working on right now is the regulatory package and looking at the timing and we'll let investors know. But uh, I think you know, with Dr. Wiseman and our R&D our team here at Sonova, we're very, very excited to be moving this program as quickly as possible. And I can also uh, say that in terms of funding of the program with our uh, bot deal that was uh, completed several months ago, uh, this is not going to be a hurdle to moving this program forward. Um, so, so in terms of, uh, there's another question here is where would the future transplants that were mentioned come from and be used, be used with immunoprotection? Um, human donors or stem cells? Are there companies working on stem cell technology for thyroid? So as far as I personally know, um, I don't know of, of any other companies that are working on uh, stem cell technologies for thyroid or even a cell therapy approach for thyroid. We're the first in the world to be able to do that. But what we see moving forward is um, some sort of a uh, stem cell derived technology that we would then do use our local immune protection technologies either through gene editing 
or through the conformal coating as two different approaches to be able to protect those cells from the immune system uh, attack. And again, this is uh, one of the approaches that we're taking for within the cell pouch um, to be able to protect those cells. Um, next question here is, what is the cell pouch made of? So importantly, the cell pouch is made of polymers that are already approved by FDA for use in other uh, medical types of um, devices. And the other part of this is that the cell pouch is, um, it's made of permanent polymers. So it can be in the body long term. Uh, the, the polymers do not uh, degrade or biodegrade because we don't want them biodegrading. We want to know where those cells are and um, we want to be able to, you know, have the opportunity to know that that transplant is sitting right in that cell pouch uh, location deep under the skin. So um, just coming to look here, I don't see any further uh, questions. Um, so one thing I do want to mention and uh, this is an example of a number of collaborations that Cernova has been working on over the years uh, that is leading to some really, really important, um, you know, potential products and clinical trials uh, coming out uh, that, that should benefit in investors and also patients. And this work involves very, very close uh, collaboration between um, Cernova's research and development team and clinical team and Dr. Wiseman's team that has taken a number of years to be able to progress. So important things is that good things take a little bit of time. And we've gotten to this point now where everyone together has agreed that there is some um, huge potential for this program. So we're very, very thrilled to be uh, having Dr. Wiseman um, working on board and bringing this uh, program out to the international world at this point in time. So um, again, thank Dr. Wiseman, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us today. Um, also want to say that a recorded version of this webinar will be made available on Cernova's website and Cernova's YouTube channel following today's discussion. So again, thank you very much and we look forward to um, a long and uh, productive relationship with you. And your patients. Thank, thank you very much too. This was a this was a lots of fun. Okay. Thanks everyone.